We'll continue looking at distinctives of the Christian faith, or we could say gifts of the Christian faith that uh, people uh, observe as they see the function of the church in their communities and around the world. So the next distinctive we will notice is the call. Call. Uh, deep in Christian theology is the conviction that it is God who seeks us. Um, he is the seeking God calling us. It's not as if we decided to go and find God. It is more, it is rather that he has come to find us. It begins right back in the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve turn away from God and God comes into the garden and finds them uh, hiding behind the bushes. Where are you, Adam? And the whole biblical drama is the story, the account, the narrative of God seeking for people. Uh, they may be hiding from him, they may be running away from him, but God pursues, he seeks. Why? Because he loves us so greatly. And uh, he knows that we were created for fellowship with him. And when we rebel against that, that intention, uh, God is sorry and he grieves about that. And so he seeks for us, call, call. I know when we lived in Somalia, that Muslim country, oftentimes our Muslim friends would ask us, why are you here? And we would say, because God has called us to be here. We live under, when God pursues us and he finds us, he then calls us to serve in his kingdom. And so we are a called people. That's a distinctive of the Christian faith. And the resurrection. The resurrection is not the resurrection of a soul, um, a singular soul, as Hinduism would say, and the reincarnation of a soul. Rather, it is the resurrection of the total person. It's a bodily resurrection. Jesus arose bodily. He is the firstborn of all of us who will be resurrected as he was resurrected. So that um, uh, in heaven someday when we meet each other we will be able to remember this class that we had and to talk about it if we wish. It'll be the total us that are resurrected not just some disembodied soul. And so the Christian faith takes very seriously the total person. If we're all to be resurrected someday we should care for our bodies now. Care for the total person. That's one reason you find all over the world where the church goes in its mission. It is involved in ministries of compassion to the whole body. Um, the whole person is to be cared for, um, not just a soul, but the total person, bodily resurrection. I can't overstate the significance of the resurrection of Christ in the Christian approach to creation. As Christ rose from the dead, so also all of creation is being redeemed and being called to new life and to resurrected life. And so the way we relate as human beings, resurrected as people who are empowered by the resurrection, as we relate to even the animal world, the way we care for our forests and the soil and the land is all part of the resurrection story. God raised Christ from the dead and all creation shall likewise someday be resurrected um, to new life, a new creation. That new creation is happening already. It will be fulfilled when he comes back again. Resurrected life, the total person, distinctive of the Christian faith. Even Judaism does not talk about the resurrection. Within Islam, it is uh, a, a, a resurrection to final judgment, to a paradise, which is not a description of the kingdom of God. Paradise is a description of uh, a realm of pleasure um, the, uh, the Christian faith invites us into a, to a new resurrection in which God's kingdom is fulfilled eternally that we participate in. Um, <clears throat> the ascension of Jesus. Um, when he resurrected from the dead, he met his disciples and several a number of different times. And then at the conclusion of 40 days, he leads his disciples outside of Jerusalem 
and he ascends into heaven. The total Jesus ascended. He did not leave a shoe behind. He didn't even leave a toenail behind. The total Jesus ascends into the heavens. This is very profound. It means that for the Christian movement, there is no such thing as a sacred bone, as um, our Buddhist friends talk about in Sri Lanka, there being a molar tooth of the Buddha. And so every year, hundreds of thousands of Buddhists take a pilgrimage to Sri Lanka to see that molar tooth of the Buddha. There is nothing like that in the Christian faith. There is no spot that is somehow uh, no geographical spot that is somehow the geographical locus of the Christian movement, like the Kaaba in the Muslim movement, the black stone, and all Muslims fa pray facing towards that black stone. There's nothing like that in the Christian faith. Christ resurrects from the dead. He goes into the heavens, ascended in heaven. The total Jesus is ascended. He, needs, he leaves no place behind that is sacred where we should meet he leaves no, no relics, nothing like that. The church is always present where people meet together in Jesus' name. It doesn't need uh, sacred um, stuff that we touch and feel and embrace. Uh, the Christian faith is the presence of Christ among those who worship in his name. That's where, that's where the locus is, the presence of the resurrected Christ, but not relics and places and, um, and geographical things. The Christian faith is freed from all of that, which is absolutely remarkable. And then there is the Holy Spirit who is poured out upon the early church and continues to be poured out upon God's people around the world as they embrace Christ and invite the Spirit of God to infill them. The Holy Spirit reveals truth, conviction about right and wrong, empowerment, new creation, the presence of God with us, uh, in season and out of season, always there. The Christian is never alone, for the Holy Spirit is there accompanying them. The Holy Spirit empowers, gives new life, brings to pass the salvation that Jesus offers us. The Holy Spirit is a very, very dear friend. I, uh, uh, and it's through the Holy Spirit that we um, that the light, that the gospel is revealed to us. We said the other day that the, that the gospel is so astonishing that no philosophy or religion has ever imagined the gospel, but it's the Holy Spirit that opens our hearts to believe the gospel, that God could actually love that much, that he would come and walk among us in Jesus and experience crucifixion and resurrection. That's all so astonishing that it sounds like an unbelievable story until the Holy Spirit opens our hearts to believe. So the Holy Spirit is a very precious friend for the Christian way and is distinctive. It's distinctive of the, Christian, of the Christian walk. And closely related to the work of the Holy Spirit is uh, repentance and conversion. I remember very well for myself uh, the day when Christ called me and I knelt and said yes to that call and experienced the gift of conversion and new life and covenant with God to follow him all the days of my life. It was not my doing. I wasn't planning to become a Christian, but the Holy Spirit called me. The Holy Spirit was at work in bringing that about, bringing about the new creation. And I'm so very, very grateful for that. And all over the world, we find that those who say yes to Christ bear witness to the new life that the Holy Spirit brings about, creation or conversion. That happens as we make the U-turn, turning away from our self-centeredness towards God who, uh, who calls us to repentance and to conversion. I have a few more distinctives as well. They're quite astonishing, aren't they? Some years ago, I was in uh, Bangkok, Thailand, and I asked a uh, former Buddhist monk who is now a pastor in an evangelical church in Bangkok, and he is baptizing 300 converts, Buddhist converts every month I asked him, how can that be? Why are so many Buddhists coming to faith in Christ? And uh, 
he had a kind of monkeyish look on his face. He said, have you ever heard of the Holy Spirit? I said, yes, I've heard of the Holy Spirit. Do you know what the Holy Spirit does? Then he said, police. <laughs> I said, well, yeah, what does the Holy Spirit do? He said, joy. The Holy Spirit gives joy. That's why so many Buddhists are coming to faith in Christ. They are touched by the joy of Christ and long to be part of that joy. Um, the fruit of the Holy Spirit, love, joy, peace, you know, the, the, uh, the uh, gentleness, long-suffering, self-control, those amazing gifts of the Holy Spirit. Joy is, the, is distinctive from happiness. Um, happiness is what we experience when everything is going fine. But joy goes much deeper than happiness. Joy is a sense of inner peace and well-being, even in adversity, even when happiness might seem to be escaping us. That gift of joy, the sense of the presence of God within the believer, a very, very special gift, especially the joy of knowing God as our loving Heavenly Father, a gift which is unimaginable, and hope. And so that sense of hope rooted in the past, but looking forward with expectation to the fulfillment of God's promises in our lives in the future as well. So the God who worked in the past is also at work in the future. So this sense of hope, of moving forward uh, toward God's grand plan, the fulfillment of God's grand plan, is very much central to the Christian faith. A, a faith touched with much hope. I remember many years ago in Somalia, uh, everything was going wrong, it seemed. There was the revolutionary government, and our schools were being taken over by the government. Many of us had to leave. And I was with a group of United Nations officials, and they asked me, David, why are you uh, living with so much hope when everything is going wrong? What is the secret of the hope within you? And I said, well, I would need to say it's Christ. And I'm confident that Christ is at work around the world and in Somalia to bring about his kingdom in his own time and way. I'm very perplexed. I don't understand how he's going to do it. Things do seem to be going very wrong, very tragically wrong, but I know God is at work. And at the end of the day, he will bring about his purposes. So that gives me hope to press on. Well, 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 they said, we wish we would become Christians. I said, well, you can. <laughs> you, you, can, you can embrace this hope that Christ offers. It's not just for a few specialists. It's God's gift to all who believe. This gift of hope. God's at work taking us forward. In his own time and way, he will bring about his kingdom and his intentions. We live with that hope. Grace, the unmerited favor of God. Although we don't deserve his gifts of grace and forgiveness, um, he does so. Um, I often think of the account in the New Testament of the prodigal son who uh, squandered the family's wealth in wild living, horrible things that he did. And when he returns to his father, his father runs down this road as hard as he can go uh, in a most undignified way, a way that an old man doesn't do. He walks with dignity. But that father even laid aside his dignity as he runs down the, the, uh, the pathway toward his son who has gone away and has squandered his wealth. And he embraces him and welcomes him home and forgives him for all that he has done. Totally unmerited grace, unmerited forgiveness. That's what we experience God in Christ. Have you benefited from our teaching ministry? Have you found TVS videos helpful and relevant? Please consider supporting us with your prayers and financial gifts. For more information, visit tvsseminary.com. Another distinctive is Christian ethics. As you read Jesus and the Sermon on the Mount and his ethical teachings there, these ethical teachings are always permeated with this sense of, 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 of love, even for the enemy the love revealed in the cross. That's the ethical center of the Christian faith. Um, an ethical center which just astonishes. It is so revolutionary, so refreshing, so healing, so amazing. And the Sermon on the Mount, in a very wonderful way, pulls together the various streams in the ethical 
system that God intends for us. God's intention in the Bible is not that, we, that only specialists practice these ethics. His intention is that all believers embrace these ethics and live in that way, this ethical way that Jesus has modeled and calls us to live. 